All right. Well, I have settled into the habit of telling you something that is a little bit funny. So these are, these are actual, taken from actual church bulletins where someone did not double check. Um, for those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. May have wanted to word that a little bit differently. Or well, here's a good one. Thursday night, potluck supper, prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> I have more, but I'm going to stop right there so we can get into our teaching. <clears throat> so we decided to begin an in-depth study on the subject of angels. When I say in-depth, of course, there is so much in the scripture that it would take probably months to study any one subject. But we're going to begin delving into the basic role and activities, the identity, the characteristics of these beings that the Bible calls angels. And we're going to use as our text, our base text for however many weeks we do this, Hebrews, the first chapter, verse 13 and 14. And this is the writer of Hebrews, which there is much debate on who that writer is. There still is not a genuine consensus of opinion. Some say Paul, others bring other authors up. But at any rate, the writer of Hebrews to the Hebrew people said, To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Question mark. And then we'll talk about the first mention. I always like to bring up first mention and last mention of any subject in the Bible. First mention is in Genesis, the 16th chapter. And it is the scripture that talks to Hagar. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And then Revelation twenty two sixteen is the last mention of angels. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. So there's, there's so much incorporated in these scriptures, even in the scriptures I just mentioned to you. For example, notice, and we don't, I don't want to get myself sidetracked, but I, Jesus, have sent my angel. I have sent. God sends angels. We have a popular theory or philosophy today that you and I, there are some that believe that Christians can dispatch angels. We find that nowhere in the Bible. We do not find that reinforced in the scriptures, that you and I can tell angels what to do. They serve us, but only through the direction of God. They don't, they don't answer to you and I. They answer to someone far above you and I, right? And so we have to be careful when we assume a position that is higher than what that which God has given us, so an authority that is higher. And my angel, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And so that's the first mention, that's the last mention in the Bible. <clears throat> We're going to start with a very basic point. Angels are real. And that may seem very simplistic, and to you and I, um, which it should, to you and I, it may be an assumption. But I think you would be shocked as to how many individuals, especially those who consider themselves to be intellectually elite, how many of the intellectually elite today uh, in our nation and in quote unquote developed countries kind of poof at uh, any thought that there's such a being as an angel. In fact, I was seated next to um, at the lamb roast yesterday. If you made it there, if you didn't, it was a wonderful event, beautiful day for it. At the lamb roast, I was seated next to Eddie Murphy, a friend of ours. Now, Eddie Murphy is a black lady who was born in Wellsville, and her dad was expecting a boy, and he named her Eddie. Okay? She's not related to the Eddie Murphy. She was actually older than the Eddie Murphy that you may be thinking of. 
and she was over the retirement benefits of UCLA University, lived for many years in, in California. Wonderful friend of ours, and we were sitting yesterday with her, talking with her and her sister Gwen, and I brought, someone brought up the subject of angels, that I would be teaching on angels today. <clears throat> and she said that while she was at UCLA, she overheard some professors in the next room, and one of them brought up the fact that someone had mentioned the reality of angels, and they were just having a good laugh over that, that anyone would be ignorant enough to believe in these things called, or these beings called angels. So don't assume that everyone believes in angels, although I think there are more and more people that are, that are beginning to come to that, to that realization. So they're mentioned many times in the Bible, mentioned many times in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, but notice with me that they're always mentioned in a way, in such a manner as to assume that the reader always already has knowledge of the reality of their existence. The Bible assumes that anyone who with relative intelligence and spiritual acumen would know that there is such a thing as angels. In fact, our verse in Hebrews said, ask in a rhetorical question form, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to those who will inherit salvation? As if the Hebrews already knew that. And as if it, it, this is all, this is knowledge that you should have. And so the Bible assumes the presence of angels, but we're going to start with base one. And uh, forgive me, I'm going to wet my whistle here. <clears throat> and we're going to begin to see what the Bible says to give us insight into their role and their activities and a basic knowledge so that we have a basic knowledge of what the Bible has to say about this. Now the Bible specifically refers to angels, but the knowledge that we have about angels, other than the Hebrews 1, 13 and 14, which really gives us an insight into their, we know that that is at least one of their roles. The rest of our knowledge, the entirety of our knowledge is um, revealed to us through interactions or through stories, accounts and events. And by those interactions, we gain knowledge as to who these beings are. So number one, angels are real. We, we know that and the Bible tells us that because the Bible tells us so. Point number one that we need to recognize, well, let me back up a moment if I can. I'm going to go with this point first. The Bible tells us they are, they are finite and they are created beings. They're not like God. They have not always been. They are created just like you and I. They were created by God. In fact, the Bible tells us in Colossians 1.16 that Jesus created them. It says in Colossians 1.16, For in him, referring to Christ, all things were created. So Jesus, we could go off a pathway here, almost like that chart. We could begin to go off a pathway talking about the deity of Christ. He is God. He did not become God. He is God. He has always been. He has not always been Jesus, the Christ, but he has always been the second person of the triune Godhead. And he actually in, was involved, the, and the triune, triune Godhead is implied in Genesis where it says, let us, let us make man in our image. That's a reference to the triune Godhead, and Christ was there. It says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now that reference, as we will speak of in a little bit here, that reference of thrones, powers, rulers, and authorities, that is a reference to the spiritual realm, and that is a reference to the angelic organization, the organization of angelic beings, different levels and powers, organization of angels. Now, they belong to a uniquely different dimension of creation, but angels like men were created by God. So we are like them in that. They were created, we're created. We just live in different dimensions currently, and we have different characteristics. They're limited to the natural order. 
which, and, and since we're limited to the natural order, I should say, we can scarcely comprehend just little glimpses of who they are and what they're like. But God has given angels higher knowledge, power, and mobility than we currently have. The, the, their ability to move about and their power is immense. Uh, they, they vary in power, but their power, when we speak of power, power in the Bible is the ability to perform. Authority is the right to command. There is a difference in the Bible when the Bible mentions authority versus power. You and I have been given authority in that we have right to command. Jesus said all authority was given to him. Authority is the right to command. A policeman stops your car not with brute physical force or power. A policeman stops your car with his hand held out with authority. And so there's a difference there. But these, these all have they, have, a, they have a power. They have power, mobility, special. They have special characteristics that we currently don't have. The time of their creation is unknown. It's not mentioned in the Bible. But one thing we do know, if someone asks you when were angels created, they were created before man and created before the earth. We know they were already in existence. How do we know that? Job, the 38th chapter, <coughs> verse 4 and 7. Jesus, or excuse me, God is speaking to Job. Job and God are having a, a conversation back and forth. And he's also, God is also speaking to the, the three helpers who were not helpers to Job. And he's asking them questions because he needs to humble them a little bit. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand, while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. So the angels shouted for joy when they saw what God created. That's kind of a goosebump moment, isn't it? It's amazing. By the way, I heard a story where some of our enlightened scientists, atheistic scientists, decided that they were at a point where we no longer need God or to believe in God. And so they said, let's tell God. And so uh, one of them was given the assignment to tell God that we, didn't, we don't need him any longer. We, we can get along by ourselves. We have AI. We have all of these different things. And so the one fellow approached God and said, uh, he said, I just wanted to let you know that humanity doesn't need you any longer. We're good. You can go about and do what, whatever you want to do. You can chill, do whatever you want. God said, okay. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, let's have a little contest. Why don't we each of us create a human being? And the scientist said, okay, that's cool. And, uh, this, and uh, he said, we got to start at the beginning. He said, that's cool. He said, uh, and so he said, the scientist bent down and grabbed a little bit of dirt. And God said, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, get your own dirt. <laughs> so they were created by God and they were created before humanity. They were created before we were created. The second thing that the Bible is very clear on in our scripture, Hebrews, the first chapter, they are spirits. They are spirits. Uh, that word spirit is the Greek word pneumata, pneumata, P-N-E-U, and that is the plural for spirit, pneuma, the Greek word pneuma. It's the same word that is used to describe God in John 4, 24, where God tells us, or excuse, yeah, God tells us that he is spirit. John 4, 24 says God is spirit, pneuma. Well, spirits, pneumata, same, same word, exact same word. This, now, what we need to understand, as I began to study this, it's amazing, I always learn more as I prepare things, and I've, I have prepared a few messages on angels. In fact, I've preached one here a year or two ago about angels. But what I came to realize, and I think we need to emphasize, is that even though they are spirits, they are not without form. They're not nebulous. They're not like a mist or a cloud. They are spirits, but they have form. They are beings, B-E-I-N-G-S. They are beings. They are spirits, invisible to our eyes most of the time. We'll talk about that in a moment. But they are beings. They have form. 
just like you and I do. They, they, we are human beings, and we all have different characteristics. None of us, the scientists tell us, are the same. Now, they are identical twins, but our fingerprints and different characteristics are different. That's why they use fingerprints. All of us are different. Evidently, the pattern in our eye is different because they use, use eye reader technology now. And we can assume by this, because of what we read in the Bible, that angels are also different. They have form. They're beings. They are a created being, but they are spirits. And they don't have flesh and blood. They don't have what we would call substance, at least as we know it. Jesus, after his resurrection, emphasized the difference between spirit and and, and human being, when he said in Luke 24, verse 39, see my hands and feet, do you remember this? See my hands and feet, it is I myself, handle me, touch me, and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And so they, they don't have bodies. We were created with bodies. The animals were created with bodies. Since they're spirits, our eyes are not constructed to see them any more than we can see a nuclear force field or we can see the electrons traveling along copper wire to provide light for us. We can't see that. Our eyes can't see it unless God gives us the ability to see them. And the Bible reveals that they have the ability to be... I don't know whether they have the ability to become visible or we have been given or we are given or humans are given the ability to see them. I'm not sure. I don't know. All I know is they become visible. And we have several instances of that. And they, they can change their appearance huh, and shuttle back and forth between the capital city of heaven and earth in an instant of time. Because they belong to another dimension. They're not held to, they're not bound to gravity or the laws of physics and earth. They operate differently than we do, like God. They live in that other realm, that other dimension. And they don't possess physically bo physical bodies intrinsically, but they may take the hu a human form when God appoints them to certain tasks. Let me put a little note, a footnote here. And that is, not only do they look like humans, but the Bible tells us there are a certain order of angels that have different appearances, like the seraphim and the cherub, cherubim. And then there are angels that, that, have, that have the face of a lion, or they, they have different appearances. So God has created an unusual order of beings, and he's called them angels. Now, the Bible tells us, for example, in Genesis, if you remember Genesis, the 18th chapter, verse 2, it talks about Abraham getting a visit from three men. He thinks they're men. They have all appearance of men, but they're angels. And they have either Abraham has been given the ability to see them, or they have, God has given them the ability to appear to Abraham in Daniel the eighth chapter just another example Daniel the eighth chapter Daniel was watching the vision trying to understand it there before me stood one who looked like a man so he he could see the angel now remember there were occasions where one person saw the angel or angels and others right with them did not see so Daniel on one occasion saw them, the others did not. But the others sensed the presence of the angels, of the angel. Because it says they became terrified and power and strength left them. So angels evidently have such power that if they come close, evidently if you're sensitive, you can feel them. They're like a force field. They operate in great power. You know, I have no doubt that they're listening to this with great interest. I can't see them, but I have no doubt that maybe they're smiling a little bit. <laughs> maybe, maybe they're saying, oh, he's got that, that's a little off. <laughs> uh, he'll find out someday, you know, that's not quite right. But they're here. 
I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm going to. The Bible implies implies through a, a verse that Jesus was admonishing and correcting his disciples and the adults. He said, speaking of children, let the little children come to me because I tell you there, it's a possessive term, their angels do always behold the face of my father in heaven. Indicating that those children each had an angel. That's where the term guardian angel came from. It has been assumed, and I think it's kind of a neat idea, the Bible doesn't indicate this anywhere, but someone has said that it could be that when you were born, before you were born, God assigned to you an angel to carry out His work, His will in your life. How many times can you look back and remember that you were protected? Or how many stories can you tell and say, I shouldn't have come out of that alive? There's no way. What was going on there? And, and again, I've got to get back off that branch and back because I'm thinking of stories even that I heard and things that, things that I have experienced that I should not have foolishly. You know, I, it could be that when I get to heaven and I meet my angel, he may just slap me right in the face the first thing. <laughs> first thing. And say, you were such a headache, right? <laughs> but I made it, praise the Lord. And so they have the ability to become visible, but God decides who sees them and when. We have that indicated to us in 2 Kings, the 6th chapter, verse 17. Do you remember the story that Elisha is being pursued, he and his servant, by the army? And at a great army, Elisha goes up into his residence and, and goes to sleep at night. Evidently, he was on an elevated area. And they wake up the next morning, and his servant goes out, and lo and behold, they are surrounded by a massive army, and it's just he and Elisha. Elisha comes out drinking his coffee. He's, all, he's just all calm and cool and collected. And he says, don't worry, there'll be more for us and be against us. And, and the servant thought he has lost his ever-loving mind, right? Because here we are, one, two, two, one, one, two, and here they are, thousands. And Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And it says, then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So Elisha was cool. This is no problem. And so they can become visible. It seems as if God determines. Of course, God's in control of everything. God determines who sees what. And when we see it, I do believe that sensitivity to the spirit, as we know, can be enhanced. For example, through prayer and fasting. I've heard of individuals that have, have seen angels after a prolonged fast or during the midst, in the middle of a fast. Their eyes they become very sensitive. As our bodies become weaker, our spirits become stronger and more sensitive. I don't quite understand. Now, I've taught on fasting. I know, the, I know the, the logic, the rationale, the scriptures about fasting, but still it's a mystery. That when we willingly do without food, we become more sensitive. And the more we pray, we become more sensitive to the spirit realm. I'll tell you one quick story. There's a pastor down in Louisville, Kentucky, who was on a prolonged fast, and they were going through a particularly difficult time and in, in their ministry. They were under attack. And um, not just earthly, but spiritual attack, and they felt it. And it was a tough, tough time. And <clears throat> he got up in the middle of the night and... Um, he went out, I think he went out to, had to leave the dog out, I believe. And while he was out there, he let the dog out and he came back. And this is a man who fasts many, many, many times and he's known for fasting and prayer. It's his, one of his ministry points. Came back, got in bed and his wife kind of woke up a little bit and said, everything okay? And she said something and he said, oh yeah, everything's fine. He said, there is an angel standing by our garage that is as tall as a telephone pole. He said, he said, when I went out, he was standing there right by our garage. So 
Yeah, I think I could go back. I don't know if I could go back to sleep. <laughs> you know, I'd say, okay, why is he there? But uh, that's another point we'll cover in the future that angels bring with them. They're all, they're all inspiring. They're powerful. They could bring immediate fear in, in their presence. But the first thing a holy angel says is fear not. Fear not. Don't be afraid. And that, that is an indication of a holy angel. So let's go to point C. They are moral beings. What do I mean by that? I mean that like you and I, we describe sometimes, although the, the line is being blurred today because up is down and down is up and, and right is wrong and wrong is right. And who are you to judge and who are you to say, you know, in this time of wokeness because we've thrown the Bible away. But we used to refer to something as immoral or moral, right? You know, they're an immoral person sometimes would be said. The same can be said about angels, because the Bible tells us that they are either holy or unholy. In fact, the Bible refers to the, <clears throat> the Bible speaks of the holy angels, God's angels, Christ's angels, and I have so many scriptures, I'll say them slowly for you. Mark 8.38, Luke 9.26, Revelation 14.10, Genesis 28.12, Luke 12.8 and 9, Matthew 13.41, and, and 16.27, and those are just a few. <clears throat> But the Bible also mentions unholy angels. <clears throat> They're specifically mentioned in 2 Peter 2, 4. And the book of Jude 6, verse 6. Referring to the angels who sinned and lost their former high station and are now being kept in some type of a holding prison until the day of judgment. The, the Bible is very, um, I wouldn't say silent, but it does not give us much background on this. However, we do know that one third of the angels rebelled when Satan rebelled in heaven and went with Satan and were cast out of heaven, barred from heaven. The Bible tells us that hell has been prepared for, quote, the devil and his angels. So there are unholy angels that forsook their holy place and chose to go with the devil, and there are holy angels. So they have a will. Like you and I, angels are moral beings with a will. They do not have to serve God. They're not forced to serve God. God has evidently created them with the ability to say yes or no. Otherwise, they could not have fallen. Something to ponder. My father, when he was, when my father became a Christian, was saved. As many of you know, my father was <clears throat> uh, one of those that they did not believe would ever become a Christian. They were shocked. The, our little town of Shelby, I was a little baby, but I've been told that our little town of Shelby was shook to the core when Charlie Ginter became a Christian. And my dad began studying the Bible. And dad, even though a brand new Christian, was a deep thinker. And I remember one of the, one of the items that bothered him, one of his questions that, frankly, his pastor, and I don't know of any other individual that's been able to answer it, he said, if there was rebellion once in heaven, what would stop rebellion from happening again in heaven? If the angels rose up one time, why couldn't they rise up again? And that worried my dad. It genuinely worried him. So the only answer I have for that <clears throat> is that we have the word of God. Thank God we have the word of God. And the word of God tells us in the end, God wins, right? 
And one thing the devil doesn't have that God has, the devil's not a creator. He's a copy machine. He can't create. God could create as many angels as he wanted. So if there's no limit. God hasn't maxed out on angels. So if he wants to make the army bigger, he can make the army bigger. So no worries, no frets. One angel destroyed a whole army in one night. One angel. And so if one angel can take on a whole army and destroy an army, I think the millions of angels that God had were good. So they have a will. They can say yes or no. Now, the interesting thing that I would like to bring out, and I know I'm running out of time. And one thing I need to insert here very quickly. I've heard people talk about their family member that's gone, gone on. Now they're an angel. No, they're not. Human beings do not become angels. We are created a special class of people, of, of beings, all to our own. Angels are angels. Human beings are human beings. Human beings do not become angels. Do not be talking to your mom or your dad or your relative. That's called talking to the dead. That's necromancy. That is forbidden in the Bible. That's witchcraft. When I hear these athletes, oh, I talk to my mom every day. You can talk to some, some, but you're not talking to your mom. You're either talking to God or you're talking to the devil. We don't, angels are not, and you're, listen, only one special privilege that we know of in the scripture was when Samuel was allowed to interact. Other than that, those who have gone on to heaven, we have no indication whatsoever that they can hear us or know what we're doing. And so please make sure that you recognize humans are created in the image of God and angels are not created in the image of God. I don't know exactly what differentiates us from angels, but I know nowhere does it say that angels are created in the image of God. Only we are. In fact, there was one Bible theologian that I was studying recently that said that he wonders if Satan did not rebel after he saw the creation of humanity, and he became jealous <coughs> because God said, let us create man in our image, and, and that drove Satan to jealousy. So he rose up against God. This the theologian wonders if Satan rose up against God because he wanted to destroy humanity. And we know that Jesus said Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And who is the target of all of his wrath? It's us. So it, it does cause us to think, and I, I'm going to, we're not going to get through this today, but I want us to recognize that we are children of Adam. We have been called children of Adam, meaning that we are born with sin in us. You don't have to teach your kids to be, you don't have to teach them to be bad. It just comes naturally. You didn't have to learn to be bad. It just comes naturally. Because we're, we have sin within us. So we're children of Adam. Meaning that like Adam, Adamic nature, we have Adamic nature. But it says that we will be children and are, after we come to Christ, children of God. John, the first chapter. So we are unique. We are recipients of God's love to such a degree that the angels don't experience Think with me. Let's think a little deeper. Why is it that the angels rebelled and they are not offered salvation? They're held, they're held until the day of judgment and hell was prepared for them. They have nowhere, nowhere do we see where God offered angel salvation. Man sinned. And God sent his son to die for us and to redeem us. That's a mystery. Why did he love us? Why does he love us? Why did he even choose to save us and yet not save the angels? The Bible says he has lavished his love on us. That's incredible. That, and, and so because of this, it's not to angels, but to man that God sent his son to die. And it is to man that not angels, that God has promised to raise us up to sit with him 
in heavenly places in Ephesians, the second chapter. Why? Why? And, and Peter said that because of this, when Peter was talking about this in 1 Peter, the first chapter, Peter's talking about this, and, and he's talking, and Paul often refers to the mystery of salvation. We don't understand. There's some things we don't understand. I don't understand. Why? And Peter said that it is also a mystery to angels. Because he said in 1 Peter 1.12, even angels long desire to look into these things. So these things that I'm talking about, these things that you and I experience, this plan of salvation, all this going on right now, which leads me, I wish I, we'll have more in the future, but angels learn. Angels are still learning. They don't know everything. They're still learning. I'll get ahead of myself here a little bit, give you a little glimpse into the next week. The Bible says that God is using the church to reveal to the principalities and powers knowledge that right now you and I are a lesson to all creation. All creation is watching what's going on here on this earth. And specifically, what's going on in the church. And the church is being, God is using the church to teach. Think about this. God is using the church to teach these angelic beings that are called to serve those children of God. That is an amazing thing. I could tell you a story that would boggle your mind. I'll tell it to you. I'll take a risk. Should I tell it to you? I'm two minutes over. I was preaching on a subject that God had been speaking to me about years ago. It is a subject that really, it is almost, a, almost akin to splitting hairs, theologically. Uh, not, not, I'm not talking about getting into heresy, but I'm talking about something that God began to show me about gates in the Scripture. And what gates represent, what gates symbolize, both here on earth and spiritually. And while I was, now you're either going to believe this or not, so it's up to you. While I was preaching on this, and I was very much aware that God was showing us things, and I preached on a Sunday night, two or three series on it. And where I was preaching was a large, our sanctuary was very large. And afterwards, we clo I closed the service. Afterwards, one of my worship, um, actually he was our drummer and could, could also play guitar. We called him Tiny. He ended up moving to Bakersfield, California. Tiny was not Tiny. And, and Tiny was um, from originally California. You wouldn't have known it because he had a southern drawl. And Ka Tiny liked gravy. He loved gravy on everything. I went out to eat breakfast with him once and and the lady said, what, would you like gravy? He said, oh yeah, on everything. Just poured it all over everything. But Tiny came up to me. Tiny was not given to um, seeing things or hearing things. He had never once mentioned anything to me that was like that. But he came up to me, and afterwards, he was over here, and afterwards he came up, he said, I've got to talk to you. And he was clearly troubled. I mean, he, it was almost like, I thought there's something bad that has happened. That's how he acted. He said, I've got to talk to you, I've got to talk to you. And I said, okay. So I went over and said goodbye to some folks. I went over, and he said, you've got to tell me, you've got to explain this to me. I said, I don't know, what, what are you talking about? He said, you've got to explain this to me. I said, I, and I mean, he just almost could not articulate whatever it was. He said, while you were preaching, while you were preaching about gates, he said, I looked up and he said, all the way around our sanctuary was a balcony. Now, we didn't have a balcony. Okay. He said, there was a balcony all the way around our sanctuary, all the way up front. And he said, it was filled with beings in white. And he said, I could see their faces. 
He said they all had different faces and he said they were all leaning over the rail listening to you preach. Now that's goosebump time. And I mean, it shook this man up. I actually had to calm him down. He said, I, he said, I saw it. He said, I could see their faces and they were listening to you and they were reacting to what you were saying. I thought about that while I was preparing this. The Bible says the angels long to look into the things that you and I are experiencing. Ladies and gentlemen, we're a part of something that is much bigger than we have any idea. Amen? Amen. We, are, we are privileged people. All right. Well, God bless you. I went over. But isn't this interesting? It is interesting. I hope it will strengthen your faith. And now I've got to go get ready and change subjects. So God bless you.